Hello, it's uh, November 17, 2015. Uh, we're here uh, doing a virtual webinar, a seminar on, uh, in this particular case, on uh, antibiotics and uh, particularly the uh, paper. Well, I, I mean, actually, Professor Anderson uh, will describe to us what his talk is going to cover. Uh, Kevin Anderson is a professor of health law, bioethics, and human rights at Boston University School of Law. Uh, I've known him for some time. He's, he's, he's written on a wide variety of issues related to intellectual property rights and drug development. He's going to introduce himself to the audience, and he's going to describe the topic of his paper. And then he's going to give a, uh, a short introduction to a paper. Uh, and when that's finished, we're going to have question and answer uh, with, the, with, the, with the other participants uh, on, on this call. And actually, uh, uh, I think before we get to Professor Anderson, I'd like to go around the, uh, the room and have people introduce themselves that are here at the KE office. And as soon as we're finished with that, the people that are joining us remotely, just so that everyone knows who everybody is. And maybe if we can start with you. Okay. My name is Claire Cassidy. Um, I work here at KEI. Hi, I'm Zach Struber, and I do communications at KEI. Hello, I'm Diana. I'm the scientific advisor at KEI. I'm Jamie Love, KEI. And I'm Elizabeth Rogers. I organize it. And then, I am. and who do we have uh, remote? Do you, can you you want to call out people, uh, Claire? And you know who's. Uh, Manal, would you like to introduce yourself? And make sure you're unmuted. All right, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Joel. Let me make sure he's unmuted. Oh. He's just oh. muted. <laughs> I think he has to unmute himself. All right, apologies. Joel can go ahead now. Okay, Joel Lection, teach health policy and work as an emergency doctor in Toronto. Uh, Aiden? Hi, uh, I'm Aiden Hollis at the University of Calgary, and I'm an economist. And then I believe the last one is Christian, if you can unmute yourself. I think. No, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Christian Wagner Haas from Buko Pharma Company Germany and we are currently running a project on anti uh, antibiotic resistance in Germany. Great. So, uh, uh, Kevin, if you if you uh, give us give everyone your your own introduction, and then just go ahead and start right in on your talk. All right. Thank you for having me, Elizabeth. Maybe you could pull up the first slide while I give a little background. So, I am a law professor. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a medical doctor, and uh, I'm not an economist. But uh, I've worked in this area of the research incentives. If you can go back to the first slide, please. The research incentives with um, antibiotics now for about a decade. And there's a lot of things going on now that, uh, that I have some hand in or some role in. So just looking at this slide, you'll see across the top there's the NDF, you know, ND4BB. Uh, That's the New Drugs for Bad Bugs. Uh, project within the European Union's IMI, Innovative Medicines Initiative. And uh, within that project, the thing on the lower left is this Drive AB, which is driving reinvestment in, in R&D and responsible antibiotic use. Drive AB is a 9.6 million euro project funded under ND for Bad Bucks uh, and under IMI as well, which you see on the slide, uh, funded by the European Union, uh, essentially as a public-private partnership with drug companies to try to look at uh, the economic incentives uh, surrounding the antibiotic market uh, in Europe and across the world. I'm also an associate fellow at Chatham House, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about, mainly about the Chatham House report today. Um, this project or this slide set that I'm showing you now is something that I presented at the uh, General Assembly meeting for Drive AP, which was held in Sweden. General Assembly is just the annual research meeting uh, for the consortium involving dozens of academics plus all the, uh, all the primary companies engaged in antibiotic R&D. Um, so that's my uh, 
that's what I'm doing now, and uh, I'll spend maybe 15 minutes, uh, no more, because I know that we want to have time for Q&A. So the, the question, the first question is, how is the antibiotic market broken? And Elizabeth, I'll try to wave my hand or something when it's time to go forward. Okay, there we go. And so this is, uh, this is U.S. data only, and this is from the Health Affairs article that I, I believe that uh, Elizabeth forwarded to everyone, and several of you would have seen it already in any event. But uh, in inflation-adjusted dollars, you can see that the U.S. antibiotic market peaked in 2005. And so if you're a drug company executive or really anybody selling a product, uh, the fact that your sector peaked in 2005 is generally not considered uh, a positive uh, market to go into. And so we'll talk a little bit about why it peaked and uh, what can be done for it, and more importantly, are there ways to incentivize antibiotic innovation without trying to drive volume? So this is not the sort of product that we want to just uh, boost volume because of the problems of resistance. So forward. Uh, this is uh, data from a study that was commissioned by the Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. Um, by ARC. And uh, it's done by Eastern Research Group. I was one of the authors of the study. I'm, I'm the, the final author of the study. And we were asked by the government to look at six specific antibiotic um, conditions, you know, HAPVAP, hospital-associated and, and ventilator-associated bacterial pneumonia, complicated urinary tract infections, et cetera. And then to try to model uh, from a company perspective what the expected net present value of, of a drug, of a, of a target product, pro product profile drug that treated that condition, uh, what that would be worth. Now, some of the assumptions that went into this model, the assumptions are available in the document itself, uh, but uh, some of the weaknesses of this study is that we modeled each drug on each condition separately. Uh, so we assumed, for example, that we would have a drug that only treated complicated intra-abdominal infections in the United States and it wouldn't treat the other things, so that's one weakness. The second is that uh, we only looked at U.S. sales data, not global. We were approximately half of the global profits from antibiotics, but still, that's a weakness. Uh, and I would have to say that a lot of the assumptions built into the, to the model, while we tried to adjust them to antibiotics as much as possible, uh, there was a, a lack of really good data, uh, as everyone probably on this call would understand for exactly how much money it cost uh, to run antibiotic clinical trials specifically, uh, as well as the assumptions that you'd build into on the, uh, you know, what the chance of a, of a drug proceeding from one phase to another, which ones fail and which ones succeed, et cetera. Uh, we did the best we could uh, based on the published data, but obviously all models like this one would benefit from much better and more transparent data on each of these parameters. But be that as it may, the, the, the results that we have here show that for two of the indications, HAPVAP and, uh, and ABOM, basically earaches, you have a negative expected net present value. In other words, a company uh, having invested money, uh, having uh, gone through an R&D program of perhaps a decade or longer, and successfully reaching the market but still have lost money on the product. Uh, for the others, uh, it was positive but not positive in the threshold range the government asked us to look at a threshold of $100 million. In other words, would a company invest millions of dollars with an expectation of a zero return? No. Uh, you know, what is the target return? We were asked to benchmark $100 million. And for none of these uh, did they come close to $100 million. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I should say, uh, before I, I went forward, I thought there was one other slide, but we'll stay here, is that we also looked at the social uh, net present value uh, for each of these. And the social, uh, it, it was a, even a more difficult uh, estimates to come up with, but we tried to say, what is it worth to society at large for having you know, a good drug for each of these conditions? And those numbers were in the billions of dollars, as opposed to being negative or small, small dollar uh, millions or tens of billions. Uh, Put another way, uh, the social value of antibiotics greatly exceeds the private value, uh, which is good news, I guess, for consumers. As long as the antibiotics are there, they're cheap and effective, they work, and they're, and they're valuable. 
uh, from a, a company perspective from, or from a societal perspective, we may get fewer of these products than we need. So this next key question is, is the situation going to get any better soon? And uh, there's, a, there's some concerns, and these concerns are driven by outstanding things that the CDC and the rest of the government are, is doing. So let's take a you know, thought about a particular superbug, so CRE. It's on the, uh, the, the CDC's urgent pathogen list, so one of the top three targets uh, for the CDC in the United States. An estimated 9,000 cases in the U.S. in 2011. Actually, the number of cases in Sweden uh, for which there's no alternative antibiotic uh, over the last uh, you know, half decade is zero. Uh, but the CDC is, tr is aggressively trying to reduce this through all sorts of infection control and prevention measures, doing exactly what public health should do. And so they're hoping to decrease that by 60%. In addition, a 50% decline is targeted in C. difficile, and you see these other conditions as well. So all of these are targets that the CDC has now announced. It's in the national strategy, a document the White House put out uh, in September of 14. And uh, from a company, from a public health perspective, these are outstanding. From a company perspective, uh, you just reduced that bad market. So uh, I said peak antibiotics 2005. Uh, from a company perspective, the, the market's going to get worse because the number of cases are going down. Excellent news for, for global public health. Uh, terrible news for the people who are making go no go decisions on uh, developing a new antibiotic. Next slide. All right. It's really slow. There we go. Um, in addition, th these are also you know so not only are the cases going to go down, the, the you know the the number of people infected with superbugs, but if the CDC is successful and also just inappropriate, wasteful treatment, uh, people that are taking antibiotics for a common viral uh, cold or something would also go down. All of these things are, will reduce, uh, if successful, and very appropriately so, uh, the unit sales of antibiotics in the United States. Next. So this is uh, just a summary of what I just said, so let's go on to the next slide. seems really slow to go forward. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the Chatham House Working Group. Um, this was uh, under Chatham House in London. I'm an associate fellow there. We worked for about two years uh, on looking at alternative business models. Most of the work revolved around prize-based or delinkage type models in which companies would not be paid based on the unit sales times the, you know, the unit price, but would be paid on some other mechanism that resembled either a reimbursement that was price-based or something else that was not based on the volume of the units sold. Uh, a lot of people were involved. They're described in the report. Uh, next slide. But everyone, uh, the report itself is the conclusions of the six uh, primary editors who are listed on the front page. Um, let's go forward. So this is a part of the process. One more slide. And uh, <clears throat> it was finally published on October 9th. Now I can, it's available on the Chatham House website. It's it's free, but uh, if anyone needs a copy, I can provide a copy to, to Elizabeth and she can make it available as well. Um, what I plan to do now with the balance of my time is to summarize some of the key findings in this report. Next. So when you thought about alternatives, what, what one could do in this space, uh, some companies, uh, notably uh, Cubist, and uh, now Cubist has been acquired by Merck, has argued for higher prices, saying that higher prices alone could solve the problem and boost innovation in this area. Uh, we've rejected higher prices for a number of reasons, one being that higher prices would drive incentives from a company perspective to overmarket and to sell the product. If we had an antibiotic that was uh, Fifty thousand or eighty thousand dollars per course of treatment, some sort of a you know a Hep C type pricing. 
then uh, the companies would have reasons to try to sell that outside of the very narrow uh, indications that uh, it may be labeled for. And we don't want to do that because of resistance. We are also are greatly concerned uh, within the Chatham House group about global access issues. Whatever the problems are with antibiotic resistance in, in countries and the deaths associated with it, it's clear that right now more people die globally. I just lost the screens. More people die globally from a lack of access to an effective antibiotic which could save them. Uh, the estimate uh, which will come out in the Lancet uh, this week will show th something in the order of 300 to 500,000 children under five dying from susceptible uh, bacterial causes that could be prevented uh, by an antibiotic that's already available today. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of feedback there. All right, can you put the slides back up? I, I don't see them. There. So we focused on delinkage, which as I've already described, uh, we're going to pay based on something other than unit volume, or hybrid models that have elements of delinkage in them. Next slide. Five uh, key recommendations, and, and I'll take them in order. Next. So I've said some of this already before, uh, but these are the primary goals. Uh, we don't want companies to be paid based on sales volume, and actually most of the companies agree with that statement. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca in particular have publicly embraced this. Um, the others, uh, the second bullet point, I guess, might be controversial, but I see, you know, if if we need to, if we want additional in innovation in the space, we can't view this as a cost-saving measure to try to reduce the amount of money that's made on antibiotics. Peak antibiotics was 2005. If we want to drive more reinvestment to the sector, I think the total reimbursement for antibiotics should go up. And then the third point is uh, is key, and I've already made it, uh, with the, the need globally to make sure that we have appropriate and actually expanded access to antibiotics. So in the West, we may have a overutilization of antibiotics. In a lot of the rest of the world, we have a, a, a severe access crisis for antibiotics. Next. Uh, these are some of the analogies. Uh, certainly, most people on the call, on this video call, will understand the prizes piece. On the insurance side, I want to say that think of uh, antibiotics perhaps as a, as a fire station. The time to build the fire station is not when the when your house is on fire. You don't want to put to, to invest in smoke detectors or water pipes or fire hydrants or fire trucks uh, after something's already happened. You need them in advance. You need them whether or not there's a fire. Um, we need antibiotics to to make everything else that happens in medicine possible, like surgery uh, and normal hospitalization. And so, possibly you want to think of this as an insurance that makes the rest of medical care and really some of, of, of modern society possible. Another possible analogy is the defense industry or big science. How do we pay for the International Space Station or CERN, uh, you know, the big science project in Switzerland and France? It was paid based on a contractual model which involved billions of dollars to solve a difficult problem with science. And uh, so all of these are being looked at. Strategic Antimicrobial Reserve is this idea that if we had an antibiotic that was a perfect silver bullet for a superbug, uh, we don't want to use it except in the most extreme circumstances. And so how how could we reimburse under the normal system for a drug that we may only want to use ten times a year for the first decade if we're if we're lucky? Uh, you know, we just can't imagine paying ten million dollars per course of treatment. So what do we do with that? How do we we should treat it as something that's being preserved for the long term as opposed to uh, a product that's sold and uh, as quickly as possible. Next. The second uh, major recommendation of the report is that we need enhanced you know, funding over the entire life cycle. So the preclinical would be research grants, think NIH or in Europe the Wellcome Trust or the Medical Research Council in England. A very broad standards. We're looking for science, and we don't want to set many parameters on what the scientists pursue. Uh, in the clinical stages, uh, there's calls for tax credits and public-private partnership contracts. Um, you know, in the orphan disease space or in the neglected disease space, we've seen a lot of this. Uh, thinking of antibiotics 
as a neglected or, or semi-orphan drug may be helpful in this area. But uh, we don't want these to go to any antibiotic. We want it to be going to antibiotics based on some sort of a threat assessment. Um, if we don't have unlimited funding, and some of it should it should be focused on the most important things. Jamie, are you? Yeah, I just want to ask a question about this slide. Uh, at the bottom, you have logos of is this who is the author of this slide? I am the author. It was a presentation uh, given at the General Assembly for the Drive AB annual research meeting in Uppsala, Sweden, uh, a couple months ago. And every slide presentation at that meeting had these logos across the bottom. The funding ultimately is from the European U Union, which is you know the blue flag and their project uh, IMI. So I was the sole author of the slide. So. Any other questions, Jamie? No, not, not right now. No, I'm all, all okay. So uh, delinkage is at the bottom, and delinkage is uh, it would be paid post registration. So uh, we're not thinking of prizes that are that are before the drug is registered with the FDA, but afterwards. And again, not prizes for just any drug, but prizes for drugs that target important superbug pathogens or things that are that are through a, a scientific based threat assessment have been identified as where our limited resources should go. Next. All right, so the third major uh, recommendation, I've already kind of prefaced it a little bit, but uh, we, we have threat assessments in the United States. The CDC did one in 2013. There's a threat assessment underway by the European Centers for Disease Control, uh, which should be out uh, in this next year, in the spring. Uh, no one has ever done, uh, to my knowledge, a global threat assessment uh, that fulfills these criteria. It's data-driven, transparent, and tries to identify the pathogens that we should be focused on the most. So, for example, the U.S. list focused only on things that were a problem in the United States. Uh, you know, XDRTB did not make the list because it wasn't considered uh, an urgent threat in the United States of America as opposed to the rest of the world. So this must be done. and. Uh, and it has not been done to this point. Next. A lot of the discussion in this area focuses on you know, innovation, let's create new molecules. It's important also to remember conservation. Uh, let's prevent the infections that need antibiotics. And then the, the third leg here is access. Because uh, as I've said, uh, you know, if we if we create new molecules but they're they're not usable by by the people that need them around the planet, then we've wasted our time. So one of the four, one of the five major conclusions here is that it has to be something that built into the system, not as an afterthought, but as a core feature, uh, that there's uh, appropriate global access uh, into the for the products. Next, this is a, a, a slide from a bulletin of the World Health Organization uh, that several of us. I contributed to. I'm the second author on this paper, um, but uh, it's self-explanatory. But if we did any of these three things in isolation, we hurt the others. So if we just flooded the world with inexpensive antibiotics, uh, that would destroy the conservation aspect. It would also undercut innovation. Uh, similarly, if we just ran conservation programs, you know, tried to reduce the use of antibiotics, uh, that would undermine innovation. It would also potentially strangle access for the people that need the drugs. So the thought is that all three of these things have to happen simultaneously in order to be effective. Next. The fifth uh, point is, is co you know, coordination. At what level uh, do we coordinate these things? You know, some of it can be done at the national level. A fair amount of it will require uh, global participation. Uh, there's a number of projects underway uh, trying to examine uh, you know, what exactly can be coordinated internationally and what are the appropriate institutions. Next. So last couple slides. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> these are some uh, things that are out there on the magnitude of incentives. Uh, Sharma and Taos, uh, this is from the Office of Health Economics. D despite its name, it's not really associated with the British government. Uh, it's, a, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the British pharmaceutical industry. 
Um, but uh, here are their numbers. The Eastern Research Group, the study I was a part of, uh, the number we came to was uh, was short of a billion. Uh, with all the provisos and limitations I gave at the beginning on the ERG study, that, that there's just a lot of data that we don't have on exactly what it does cost to run an antibiotic trial mm -hmm. and what the failure rates are now. And then uh, in England, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, appointed Jim O'Neill, an economist from Goldman Sachs, uh, to do an independent review. Uh, that review site, amrreview.org, uh, a lot of information that uh, they've been very active in the past 12 months, lots of visibility. Um, but the, the number that they reported was two to four billion dollars uh, without much transparency about exactly what was behind it. And I have to say that uh, a major effort in Drive AB, this project that I'm working on, uh, that I'm a partner in with the European Union, will be to do for Europe, uh, you know, a, a good scoping. A, very complex modeling of what sort of size of innovation incentives will be necessary uh, to get the drugs that we're looking for. Um, and these would, would predominantly be full buyout type models in which uh, the companies will be reimbursed for the cost uh, of, you know, of their innovation plus the profit. And then from that point forward, uh, sale and distribution of the drugs will be on a fully generic marginal cost of production basis. Next. Um, this is, uh, I think, my last slide. It just shows, uh, again, this data. Uh, the red line is antibiotic uh, sales in the U.S. Uh, the green line is total U.S. market sales. You see the, all drugs are going up, and this is, uh, you know, two years old, whereas antibiotics are going down. Uh, if in the U.S. we spent what President Obama has called for, which is an extra $1.7 billion worth of various package package between economic incentives and, and CDC infection control and related measures in hospitals. If we spent that money um, in the U.S., we would essentially return our U.S. antibiotic spending to 2009 levels. Uh, so it's, it's eminently affordable, and what we buy uh, for returning our expenditures to 2009 levels is, uh, is preserving probably the most viable uh, drug class in, in human history and preserving it instead of allowing it to be dissipated and destroyed the resistance. I think that was the last slide. Right. And so with that, uh, I'll pause for questions. <clears throat> let's let's uh, start with the people uh, that are remote. If anyone has a question they'd like to start off with. And also, as we have done before, if someone's speaking and you'd like to ask the next question, please indicate in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, sure, I'll start. So, Kevin, um, where do you... I can see antibiotic use being controlled um, in Europe or North America, but my wife just came back from working with MSF in Uganda, um, and talked about how antibiotics were being used there. So even if we were successful in developing these new antibiotics and limiting them in, um, in Europe, North America, Australia, etc., um, how are we going to deal with the problem of the way they're used in these other countries that lack um, effective regulatory mechanisms and given the way that transportation is now you know an antibiotic resistant whatever that appears in Thailand today will be in the United States or Canada tomorrow. <clears throat> so the, uh, the premises of your question are completely correct that uh, we know that uh, you know it's that many of the versions of CRE uh, originated out of the Indian subcontinent, and we know that the use of cephalosporins uh, in the outpatient setting, which is shocking, is uh, off the charts in India as opposed to almost non-existent in the West. So without a doubt, this is a global collective action problem. It's something that one country or one region cannot solve without collaboration and, ass and assistance across multiple countries. So I take that as a given, and a lot of people focused on this collective action problem. So the, the question becomes, um, 
you know, can we improve the current situation uh, through coordination? Um, and what is it, what is in the, the mix? What, what is part of the grand bargain for a country like India uh, or Uganda or, or, or Nigeria to collaborate with the system? So what's proposed is that uh, most of the cost, all the cost for the innovation piece of this equation uh, comes from the, the richer countries of the world, from, from the OECD or the G20 or some subset of that. And that part of what has to be provided um, in order to, to make this effective is, is better laboratory surveillance equipment throughout the world. So WHO has called for that, but there's no funding for it. And uh, better efforts to help countries uh, to improve their regulation of antibiotics. So India has now pulled antibiotics off of the list of things that can be that can be bought and sold, uh, you know, without a prescription. Uh, many basic antibiotics are still able to be purchased that way, it's, and it's probably appropriate, uh, but not cephalosporins at, at this point. India made that change in the last year. So, what's required here to solve innovation? Is, is just uh, the rich countries. What's required to solve global conservation, preventing the wasteful overuse, is, uh, is really uh, something that comes through a global consensus and is funded by you know, wealthier countries. The last piece I want to talk about is, is animal use, because 90% uh, of the increase in antibiotic utilization globally over the next 20 years is projected to come in the animal agricultural sector. The bulk of that in China and Brazil, and uh, and you know if if we do a lot of things in human medicine and fail to to address the overutilization of antibiotics uh, in, in, in as growth promoters, particularly in agriculture, uh, then of course long term we've undermined our efforts. Um, having said that, <clears throat> countries that have strong local uh, and regional control efforts see less antibiotic resistance. So the, the Nordic countries in particular um, are, are just more effective. Even with travelers coming from abroad, uh, their strong infection control and prevention systems um, give them an extra layer of defense. So it's completely true that, that these bugs migrate globally, um, but the local institutions also have an effect. So it's a global problem, requires collective action. Uh, no one country can solve this alone, but uh, the thought is we can improve our situation by collaborating. Other, uh, other questions from the people that are remote? Yeah. I believe Christian has a question. Oh, oh we have a couple of questions. So my, my microphone is working? Yes. Okay, so uh, Kevin, uh, thank you very much. So coming back to your introduction where you describe uh, your modeling of the uh, net uh, present value, um, you mentioned that uh, the expected profit is less than $100 million, so it's not uh, worth for the companies to invest. So my question is, why do you think uh, it's less than 100 and, uh and because we all know uh, the, uh, if, the com if the companies develop new medicines, new uh, chemical entities, they uh, put the price as high as possible because they say it's something new where they can charge a higher profit. So uh, wh why, why do you say uh, the profit is will not be high enough so the companies will not be willing to invest? <clears throat> so. Uh you know, let me be you know excruciatingly clear on that. The one hundred million dollar target threshold was not a conclusion of the Eastern Research Group study. It was a benchmark that was given us by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So we were asked to evaluate whether any of the six indications would exceed that benchmark. Okay, and uh, none of them did. But uh, it was the the funder of the study, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, that set the benchmark. Secondly, though, uh, in conversations with most companies, they have uh, a lot of other, you know, alternative investments within pharma, uh, hepatitis C and oncology, and uh, you know we know, we all understand the all the craziness and, and aggressive pricing that's going on uh, within many areas of, of drugs, and so. As long as they have alternative investments that have a net present value that, that far exceeds antibiotics, 
then it's difficult for the antibiotic people within a company like AstraZeneca or Roche Genentech or Merck um, or GSK to argue for any allocation of funds. You know, they go into their capital allocation meetings and they lose out to um, you know, whatever other drug is out there that has a, a, a much more aggressive number. Um, so there's nothing magical about the 100 million, but I, I still think it, ref, it reflects a, a comparative reality that uh, compared to other drug classes and other potential, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's not as good. Now, one way to address that might be just to turn down the, the energy in those other drug classes. You know, maybe what we're doing is dramatically over-reimbursing oncology or, or hepatitis, you know. But uh, assume taking that aside, it's clear that, that antibiotics are, are at the bottom of the list or near the bottom of the list in, in internal company meetings, and therefore we have a fairly well-established uh, pattern of, of companies in the past 15 years under-investing in, uh, in these molecules. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a zero value, but it's a low value compared to other diseases. So. A, a negative value is, is always a problem, but... Uh, but uh, any positive value might, in, in, a, in a different world, attract investment. Uh, but it's the combination of a small positive value compared to other, you know, development programs that have much larger positive values, mm -hmm. and that it's not just anyone who can do this, but you know, a relatively small subset of companies with the technical knowledge to to develop and bring these products towards market. Uh, so within the people that could do it, they have more attractive alternatives, uh, even if the value is positive. If it's negative, then there's no reason for the company to pursue it unless it's, it's yeah, a charitable okay. project. Mm -hmm. But uh, I should point out, just to make it, I, I mentioned it, but uh, another weakness of the ERG study is that it models these indications separately and, and only U.S. sales. So, um, so you know, if you added Europe in there, these numbers should be larger. And hopefully for Drive AB, uh, we'll do a, a global assessment, not just a regionally based assessment. Okay, I believe Aiden had the, the next question. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Kevin, you uh, mentioned that, uh, well, that delinkage is uh, an important uh, direction. Uh, but in any delinkage mechanism, uh, we need to have uh, different ways of, or we need to think about different ways of rewarding the uh, company that uh, essentially gives up the right to earn profits from the sale of the product at a high price. So then uh, the possibilities are essentially to have something which is uh, more or less cost-based, and you mentioned that. An alternative is to have something that's value-based, uh, and yet another alternative is to have some kind of prioritization exercise in which, um, I guess, uh, values of different possible uh, antibiotics are estimated in advance, and then you have differential rewards uh, which are related to that prioritization exercise outcome. Um, <clears throat> what, what do you think is feasible, and is there some uh, middle ground there, or... How do those relate? So the um, first answer is that the Chatham House report does not get into this level of detail of exactly how the reward structure should look. Um, you know, and at this point, uh, Drive AB also does not have detailed recommendations. We're one year into a three-year project. Uh, it's it's probably probably at the Amsterdam meeting in June. Uh, there'll be a little more detail on where Drive AB is going. Um, but uh, privately, you know, on the side, a, a couple of us uh, have written an article which has it's been accepted after peer review at Lancet Infectious Diseases, but it's not in press yet, in which we try to lay out some target product profiles of different types of antibiotics and then how the reward structure should differentiate. So, you know, a, a, a fourth or fifth, you know, you know, you know, another quinolone for skin and skin structure infection would get nothing, uh, whereas a, a oral first-in-class effective against gram-negative superbug pathogens, uh, you know, would have a would have an outstanding, you know, remarkable reward in, in the in the realm of, of two or three billion dollars sort of 
uh, cash out payment uh, made to the company in exchange for its IP. That doesn't sound like a large number. Uh, I mean, for the you know industry which is looking at the suppositories years of the world. Uh, so compared to the social value of such a drug, you know, three billion would still be a remarkable uh, bargain, right? Right. Is that your point? No, that it's a really small number for the companies which are looking at. You know, if you have a, an outstanding drug, a kind of a, you know like Savaldi or something, uh, three billion dollars is is not uh, your target. Yeah. So from the company perspective, uh, the co-author of this paper I'm talking about is John Rex, who has right. anti-infective, you know, discovery for AstraZeneca. Uh, actually, I think they would be, you know, I know that they would be happy with such a number because uh, what they're getting, what they model now for such a drug is a couple hundred sales in the U.S., no sales in Scandinavia. You know, so you know, having a, a clear two or three billion dollar prize hanging out there for such a thing is, is a market that he can, can go to his executives and say this we have a global social responsibility of antibiotics we want to keep this space alive and, and, and there's a reward there uh, a reward in which they don't know whether they'll have any cases and if so what, what their price per case would be is, is more difficult so you're right it's a, it's a low number compared to Savaldi or you know the next big thing whatever pharma comes up with but I think the companies would, um, would still find it much more attractive than the, the status quo. Um, I believe Joel also had a comment if you want to um, expand on that comment on the chat, Joel. Um, make sure we unmute you before. Put, put me in the queue as well. Apologies. Because uh, I'm not connected to the chat mm -hmm. thing, so I can't. Okay, so just go, going back to the delinkage for a minute, Kevin. Um, wouldn't it really have to be mandatory as opposed to voluntary for the companies? If you made it voluntary, and com picking up on the point that Aiden was making, if you from if you met, if you accepted delinkage and you saw you could make two billion or three billion, and without delinkage, if especially if the drug was was highly effective. Um, against serious um, conditions, you saw you could make ten billion. Um, any rational company and its investors would reject the um, the voluntary delinkage and um, just go out and promote the the drug as aggressively as they can. And yes, make money in the, a lot of money in the short term, but make the drug useless in the long term. Um, so was this issue of voluntary versus mandatory delinkage addressed? It was discussed in, in, in many different fora, you know, not, not just within Chatham House, but it's, it's an active point within Drive AB and every place that these issues are being discussed now. So one thing about voluntary is that it's not like the companies are able to, to price these drugs at orphan prices because Unlike almost every other drug class, there's very high substitutability with antibiotics. Um, there's really remarkably few cases in which no other antibiotic is effective. And many of the antibiotics against which a new antibiotic must compete is generic. So, you know, daptomycin in the United States has to compete against vancomycin, which has been generic for decades. And when daptomycin goes generic here in two more years, uh, the, the next hospital-based skin structure drug will have to compete against both that generic Vanco and generic Dapto. And, you know, vancomycin remains effective in many situations. So it's, it's, it's difficult for the companies to price it. It's not like Savaldi where there wasn't, where the, well, the alternative course of treatment was, was vastly inferior. Um, it's, it's unclear in many circumstances, you know, especially with the lack of diagnostics, uh, which drug is better. And, and there's high substitutability uh, even if you had a clear diagnostic. So the first answer is the companies lack the pricing power to really do a $10 billion antibiotic. I, I think that that's just not, you know, possible right now. The, um, the second part 
is a uh, is what would companies do with a voluntary incentive? It's possible to say all of your molecules are in or out to kind of give them, you know, in or out, but 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 you can't cherry pick, which I think is a is a valuable idea. Uh, that can be done by contract. Um, so the, the question really boils down to why would a company be out? Um, you know, it, it, they would be out only if they thought they could do dramatically better with their drug, uh, you know, outside of the system. And it, it doesn't, and that's another reason why I say at the top that we're not looking at this as a cost-saving move, as a way to reduce incentives. We want to increase incentives in the space and make it so that this is, is an attractive area. The final thing I'll say is that built into to the our new world that we're getting now is, is a lot more emphasis on antibiotic stewardship and conservation. And so any company that came with a new antibiotic and refused to go into the system is going to face the headwinds of, of two things. One is much stronger conservation, much stronger stewardship globally. And secondly, they're going to face the competition from a generically priced outstanding drug that did go through the delinkage system. So their ability to charge 10,000 or 100,000 per course of treatment for their antibiotic is going to be greatly affected by the presence not only of generic antibiotics, vancomycin, but generically priced antibiotics that came through delinkage. So the bigger problem is that the companies look at this and they, and they rightly say, voluntary or not, we're all going to have to go in because we won't be able to compete against any drugs that went through the system. Uh, they're going to be generically priced and and better, and uh, you know. So we really see this as an all or nothing. Uh, <coughs> am I muted? Still? Go ahead. Um, Kevin, you said uh, this, Jamie. You said there was. A, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, just fine. You said there was a ten billion dollars in the U.S. market, roughly, or $10 or $9 billion in the U.S. market for antibiotics right now? <clears throat> Less. Less now. Like what? Uh, yeah. Oh. The, the, the U.S. market for antibacterials is, is around $8 billion right now. Do you know what it is globally? Uh, globally, the numbers are harder. They're, they're closer to, to 35 to $40 billion. That would, that would make it larger than the HIV market, then. For anti antibacterials, yes. No, but I mean, that's... I mean, I mean, that would make it larger than the market for antiretroviral drugs for HIV, I believe, then, at 30, 35 billion, right, for the, se the sector? I, I don't know the, I don't have the global market for HIV drugs in front of me, but 35 billion is the number for antibacterials, yes. I mean, that's actually a, <clears throat> I mean, as I understand it, that's, that's actually a pretty big number, but then within that number, uh, do you have a, do you know what private companies are spending on R and D in that sector right now? There's not there are not good estimates of what the companies are spending in R and D in that sector. Because if you're talking about massive public subsidies for, for research and development, I mean, if the companies are making thirty five billion dollars a year, like what, what what do you reckon the uh, I mean, and if if they were reinvesting. Let's just say they're, they're investing 10% uh, uh, of that uh, back in R&D. That would be three and a half billion. If they're re if they're investing 5% back, that would be uh, you know uh, more, more than a billion and a half dollars a year. I mean, do you think that the private sector investment is anywhere near a billion dollars? Jamie, I, I don't have good I don't have good numbers. I do have an anecdote for you that you know the biggest spender for antibiotic R&D in the United States was Cubist uh, before it was acquired by Merck. And the first thing Merck did upon acquiring Cubist was to close down all of its early stage R&D operations and, and firing those people. So yes. the numbers are inadequate and not getting better. One thing I'm, I'm just, I mean, you say I mentioned this is because uh, 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 what, one, one mechanism might, might just be to say that if you sell antibiotic drugs, you should be required to reinvest a certain amount of your sales back into redevelopment to develop new drugs. I mean, if you if you look at that as a as a uh, depletion model, like out of natural resource economics, where you feel like every time you, you sell a product, you're generating 
you're, you're depleting the existing stock, but also you you, you want to develop new drugs. If if the if the companies are not themselves reinvesting, you could uh, I, I, I'm just given given the the size of the market, which is not not small. I'm just I'm just uh, and what what you seem to be suggesting is there's almost no reinvestment uh, back into R and D by the companies. I mean that that itself is it's not like you're not making any money off the market. It's just that they're not putting anything back into R and D from what you suggest.